All right, so uh, although what I'm talking about today is relevant to every one of us in the room, I want to direct my comments particularly to fathers. Uh, We're in a series of messages called Fixer Upper. Uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines filmed 179 episodes of Fixer Upper in which they fixed up houses. We're talking about how do we fix up our minds so we learn to think better, think the way God wants us to think, and think in such a way that we can experience the happiness God wants us to have. Uh, For our instruction, we're looking at the book of Philippians. If you want to follow along with uh, in our uh, Bibles uh, in our seats, uh, today it's on page 1,179. So as we open this book, we find the Apostle Paul in prison in Rome. He could have been angry. He could have been uh, depressed that he was stuck in prison. Uh, But not the Apostle Paul. Some 19 times in this uh, book, uh, he mentions his joy. Uh, What's the secret of his joy? Well, it comes in another word. He mentions 16 times in the book the word mind. The secret to experiencing joy that God wants us to experience is in the way we think. If you want to be happy, you have to think right. So far, he has introduced us to two wrong ways of thinking that can steal our happiness One wrong way to think is to think that circumstances dictate our happiness. We think, yeah, that's right. Uh, I've got a sickness I'm battling. Uh, I've got financial struggles. Maybe I had a fight with my mate or a family member or a close friend. So I have every right to be unhappy. No. The Apostle Paul was in prison. He'd been beaten. He was facing trial where he could be uh, put to death. Yet he exudes joy. Circumstances do not need to dictate our happiness. Jory, my wife, was in a serious uh, car accident a number of years ago in Kenya. Uh, The car went off the road and down the cliff, and uh, she broke her back, and she was life-flighted to University Hospital in Nairobi. She was there two weeks in pain, didn't know anybody. Uh, She could have been depressed. She could have been angry, uh, but not Jory. She always rolls with whatever life brings her, and she said, God, you know, as long as I'm here, help me to be peaceful about it and make a difference in this hospital. And you know, the people there came to love her. Uh, She was the only blonde in the hospital, and uh, uh, that's just the way to deal with our circumstances. The second wrong way to think is to think people determine our happiness. We think that if people are unfair with us, people are mean to us, they uh, do stupid things, that we have a right to be unhappy. But uh, people don't determine our happiness. We do. Some of us are giving people way too much power over our lives. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to give other people control over our happiness? In our text today, the apostle introduces us to a third wrong way of thinking that can steal our happiness, thinking negatively. Uh, When things happen, we're not to go negative and think all the worst possible things. Apostle Paul did not think negatively, even though he'd been beaten and thrown in prison, was facing trial, could be executed. He writes in Philippians 2.17, Even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Even though he was in prison, he was rejoicing. Four times in these two verses, he uses the word rejoice, Cairo. Whether you're a teenager or a parent, single or married, I know you want to be happy. How do we find it? It all has to do with our mind. If you want to be happy, You must learn to think positively. How can we think positively? The Apostle Paul suggests three ways to think positively and find happiness. First, recognize that happiness is your responsibility. So we're going to look at some verses. I want you to read these with me. Paul writes, read this with me. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, in Greek... Uh, the meaning of a sentence often 
is found in the order of the words in the sentence. So often the author will keep the main word till the end of the sentence for emphasis. And that's what Paul does in this sense. So let me read you uh, this verse in the Greek text. So, my beloved brothers and sisters, just as you have always obeyed, not only when I'm with you, but now all the more in my absence, metafabu, with fear, kaitramu, and trembling, tain energain soterion, your salvation, notice there's no verb yet, kater gazeste, work out. He saves it to the end of the sentence because that's where he puts, he's putting his emphasis. There's something you have to do to work out your salvation. You have a responsibility to choose happiness. That's not something God can do for you. What does Paul mean when he says, continue to work out your salvation? You say, I thought salvation was something God gave us, that, that, we, that we don't have to work for it. Well, what is it? Is it? Is it free from God, or is it something we work for? Well, the Bible's very clear on this. Paul says, read this with me. You may know this verse. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that anyone can boast. Paul teaches that uh, we don't earn our salvation. It's a gift from God. So what does Paul mean when he says, continue to work out your salvation? He writes to Philippians who have become Christians. He isn't suggesting that they have to work in order to receive their salvation from God. God has given that to us. He's referring to the ongoing process of living out the implications of putting your faith in Christ. God uh, uh, starts in us when we give our lives to Christ. He's given us the free gift of salvation. He's given us forgiveness. He gives us the promise of eternal life in heaven. He gives us the Holy Spirit. So we have God's power within us if we respond to Christ. We have every reason to rejoice. Now we have to do our part in living out that happiness. God gives us all the resources in Christ we need in order to be happy. But he can't make us happy. That's our choice. Paul tells us, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. After all God did for us, creating this beautiful world, isn't it beautiful today? Giving us uh, life, sending his son to show us who God is and dying for our sins so we can have forgiveness. We should live with fear and trembling. We should tremble at the thought of after all God has given us, living with negativity and being sour and whining and complaining. When I was in college, in graduate school, I rode my bike a lot. When I would ride up uh, tough hills like Burnside from downtown to Mount Calvary Cemetery or up Skyline or up the Coast Range, my legs would burn and sometimes I'd think, I don't think I can make this. Then I would picture in my mind Jesus carrying the cross up the hill, something much harder. And I would think that if he did that for me, then I can make it up this hill. Most fathers work to provide for their families. I know many mothers work. Some mothers are the primary providers for their homes. But most men see it as their role to provide. And they do it without complaining. Dads work hard to put food on the table, roof over our heads. They work hard to put money away for college for their kids. I mean, think of it. They put, and that's no small job today. They put this money away for their kids so their kids can go and throw Frisbees on a lawn for four years. I mean, it works out to about $300 a toss. Uh, Jory's dad and my dad provided well for our families. After Jory and I got married, they, they helped us from time to time financially. They helped us do things that we couldn't do, that our kids couldn't do without their help. I think we all appreciate what our dads have done for us, but we probably don't show our appreciation enough. So I'd like to have all the dads 
and granddads stand at this time. Just wherever you are, stand up. Way in the back. Um, there are many things we need to thank you for, but today I just want to stick with the basics. We want to thank you for providing for us. So I want us to give them a hand, but this isn't just a kind of a easy going uh, uh, clapping, but more like the Toronto Raptors, you know, cheering for their team. So let's give them a hand for providing. All the wives and kids are saying, keep it up, Dad. You're doing great. So Paul writes, read verse 12 with me. As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Paul wants them to learn to think positively, not only when he's around, but even when he's absent. Uh, Our choice to think positively and choose to be happy is something we're supposed to do 24-7, not just when we think somebody's watching us. Uh, When I was in high school, for two weeks of every year, my total focus was on making the basketball team. I'd get up in the morning and I'd think about what I had to do that day to impress the coach, to make sure I made the team. And... uh, uh, for, you know, for two weeks, he was the sun around which we orbited. Forty guys would try out. And if he told us to run sprints up and down the basketball court, we ran sprints until our legs felt like they are going to die. If he told us to hold out our hands or hold up our hands on defense, we did it until we thought our shoulders would quit. If we made a mistake, made a turnover, or missed a shot, First thing we'd do is look over to see if the coach was looking at us. Sometimes we got away with an embarrassing mistake. Other times we'd look at the coach and we'd say, crud, he didn't see one of my best moves. We always wonder if the coach was looking. We don't have to wonder about that with God. He sees everything we do. He's always watching us. And so it's our responsibility to think positively all through the day, because God is watching us. The second way to think positively is to rely on God's power. Read verse 13 with me. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. We work out our salvation and take responsibility for our happiness with trembling. But it doesn't all depend on us. God says he's there. He gives us the Holy Spirit if we give our faith, put our faith in Christ. And the Holy Spirit gives us the will to act, to fulfill his good purpose. Uh, The Holy Spirit gives us that will and desire uh, to live the way God wants us to. Uh, If you have a tendency to think negatively, something happens to you bad and you just kind of go dark, You say, I don't think I can ever change the way I think about things. God says, no, I've given you my Holy Spirit, and he can change you from the inside out. The Christian life is a process of God at the center of it from the beginning. Um, It's Christ-centered from the beginning. Christ is the one that initiates salvation with us. He draws us to himself. When we commit our lives to him, Christ is the one who initiated coming to the earth to save us. When we commit our lives to him, the Holy Spirit comes in and he works within us. So now we're able to obey God's commands. We're able to think positively and experience the joy he came to give us because God's working inside of us. When Paul gives us the command, rejoice in the Lord always, God gives us the power to obey that. You say, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I'm going to rejoice always. God says, no, you can. I've given you your Holy Spirit that uh, that works within you. Um, I gave you the command to rejoice. I gave you the command to live with joy. And I've given you my Holy Spirit to enable you to do it. All you have to do is rely on the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Uh, Giving the Holy Spirit doesn't reduce 
our responsibility, it actually increases it. Some people talk about getting out of the way and letting God work through them. God hasn't chosen to work without us. He wants to work with us. He wants our minds and our wills fully engaged. The Bible refers to the Christian as a soldier, a servant, an ambassador, a watchman. Metaphors that show us that he expects us to work. If, if God was going to do all the work, many of the commands that we read in the Bible given to us should be written to God. God works in us. God in the, uh, Paul in this text brings together God's part and our part. We work and God works in us. The Christian life is not either or. Either we work or we sit back passively and let God work. It's we work and God works with us. So the way I like to say it, work as if it all depends on you and pray as if it all depends on God. In C.S. Lewis' uh, book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Aslan, uh, the great lion who's the Christ figure, uh, takes uh, Peter and Lucy and Susan and Edmund and all the animals who will follow him. Let me just read it. He says, our day's work is not yet over. He's uh, redeeming Narnia from the wicked witch who has it under a spell. Everything's frozen. He says, Our day's work is not yet over, and if the witch is to be finally defeated before bedtime, we must find the battle at once. And join in, I hope, sir, added the largest of the centaurs. Of course, said Aslan. And now, those who can't keep up, that is, children, dwarfs, small animals, must ride on the backs of those who can, that is, lions, centaurs, unicorns, horses, giants, and eagles. Those who are good with their noses must come in the front with us lions to smell out where the battle is. Look lively and sort yourselves. And with a great deal of bustle and cheering, they did. The most pleased of the lot was the other lion, who kept running around everywhere, pretending to be very busy, but really in order to say to everyone he met, did you hear what he said? Us lions? That means him and me. Us lions. That's what I like about Aslan. No side. No standoffishness. Us lions. That means him and me. At least he went on saying this till Aslan had loaded him up with three dwarfs, one dryad, two rabbits, and a hedgehog. That steadied him a bit. God chooses to team with us. He works with us. He works in us. And we work out. The power comes from the Holy Spirit, and the result is thinking positively and experiencing his happiness. Fathers, invite Christ into your life if you have not done that. Say that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and you want him in your life. He will help you to become a better father. Maybe you were robbed of a loving relationship with your father growing up because your father was an alcoholic. God will show you his true love. Maybe issues of rage and anger caused your father to abuse you. God can teach you forgiveness and gentleness. Christ can help you be the father you want to be. So, recognize that thinking positively is your responsibility. Rely on God's power. And three, renounce grumbling and arguing. Read this verse with me. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. God wants nothing to do with grumbling and arguing. If you've read the book of Exodus, you know how disgusted God was with the Israelites for complaining all the time, complaining against him. Complaining and arguing are inappropriate for the child of God. Why? Read uh, these verses with me. So that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. I mean, anyone can argue and complain. Christ followers are to be different. Uh, Choosing to live with peace and joy in the midst of difficult circumstances causes us to stand out like stars in a dark sky. If you're gloomy and always look on the dark side, 
How are you different from anybody else in the world? If you're griping and whining, complaining, you won't be shining. Only as you obey God and cultivate a joyful disposition can you shine in the world. People who have a smile, they come in and they light up a room. We just enjoy being with them. Uh, Nicholas Christakis of Yale University led a study of 5,000 people, face-to-face interviews. He said, if someone smiles at you, you smile back. That's right. He says, if you're positive and grateful, the people you encounter likely will be the same. Why? Because our emotions are contagious. He finds the same with social media. The emotional tone, he says, of social network posts has an effect on the language of those who read the posts. So, fathers, I want to challenge us this morning. If we want to please God and have a good influence on our families, we must stop complaining and start smiling. Uh, We need to set the example. If we want to be happy, we must break free of negative thinking. If you want to be happy, you must think positively. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these words from the Apostle Paul. Thank you for his example. He was beaten. He was thrown in prison. He was awaiting trial or he could be put to death. And yet, he's joyful. And he talks about it over and over again. We want to be the same. Even though we may be facing tough times, people may do things that aren't good, we want to experience your joy in the midst of that. And so we commit ourselves to that right now. So I want you to pray to God right now. If you've never given your life to Christ, Why don't you ask him into your life right now? Say, I believe you're the son of God. Would you come in, forgive my sins, and live inside of me? And if you want to commit yourself to living a joyful, a happy life, and thinking positively, tell him that, that you want to try to go for that this week, and you want to rely on the power of his Holy Spirit. So everybody pray for just a minute. Thank you, God, for all that you've done for us, giving us life and new life in Christ. And we just thank you. And we don't want to, we want to experience it with fear and trembling. We don't want to live a dark life after all you've done for us. So help us. In Jesus' name we pray.